Behavioral ecologist Marion Petrie has tackled this puzzling phenomenon. Darwin once said that the sight of the peacock's train whenever I gaze at it makes me sick because he couldn't understand how something that was clearly detrimental to survival could have evolved. If survival of the fittest was at work, you would think that peacocks would have died out. But Darwin realized that evolution wasn't just about surviving. It involved something else. Sex. Darwin proposed that the female brain played a key role in evolution. Female birds, he argued, preferred males with bright feathers and flashy tails. Because these flashy males were more successful with the girls, they had more offspring. Over many generations, their brighter colors spread through the population, and gradually, dull-colored birds died out. For over a century, no one investigated to see if this was true, until Petrie decided to tackle the problem. On a peafowl farm in Norfolk, England, she decided to find out if peahens really preferred the peacocks with the flashiest tails. Her research tool? A pair of scissors. To make some of the flashiest males a little less fancy, she cut off 20 outer eye spots on their tails. During the mating season, Petrie and her team watched to see whether the cut-down peacocks or their intact rivals were the biggest hit with the girls. We recorded mating success of each particular male and we found that peacocks with the fancier tails um, actually achieved more matings. Petrie found that a bird with a full tail was more than twice as likely to mate than one with a cut-down tail. Darwin was right. Female choice drives the evolution of colorful long-tailed birds. But the result opens up another question. Why have generations of females chosen mates with bright colors and flashy tails? The answer could lie in the quality of their genes. Only the males with the best genes are strong enough to grow the longest tails and produce the brightest colors. By mating with the most colorful males, the females help to ensure that their offspring will survive and reproduce. Female choice explains why male birds are so brightly colored, just as Darwin predicted. Once again, Darwin's theory survives intact. But one final mystery remains. Biologists need to show how change happens. How, on the microscopic level, could this evolve into a human? From all the evidence we've seen so far, it seems that Darwin was right. Life evolved. Over millions of years, nature transformed simple living things into modern plants and animals. Back in the 19th century, Darwin didn't have the tools to explain how. But today, at last, we can. In the last few decades, a revolution has swept through biology. Researchers now have the tools to unravel the greatest riddle of all, how one species turns into another. The first clue came in 1953 with the discovery of the structure of DNA. DNA carries the genetic instructions for building life. It's passed down from one generation to the next. Unravel its coiled double helix structure and you find stretches of code called genes. We have around 22,000 genes in our DNA. They carry the information that determines eye color, height, and just about everything that makes us, us. It's the genes that tell an embryo what to become. One set of genes will produce a fish. Another set will make a frog. And it's the genes that tell scientists how one living thing transforms over millions of years into another. At 
the University of California in Berkeley, Professor Mike Levine and grad student Brad Davidson have discovered that changing just one gene can make a huge leap in body design. They study sea squirts. Well, it looks humble, doesn't look like much when you compare it to most other animals. But in the laboratory, it's a star. Researchers consider the sea squirt larva a good approximation of what our early human ancestors might have looked like around 550 million years ago. If they're right, then the human heart evolved from a heart like the sea squirts. Our heart has four chambers. Frogs or snakes, their hearts have three chambers. And then you go down to fish, they have two chambers. Well, the sea squirt heart has only one chamber, but it is unquestionably related to our heart. So can this humble creature tell us how our heart evolved? <laughs> At a harbor near San Francisco, the team collects sea squirts for an experiment. Back in the laboratory, Davidson extracts and fertilizes their eggs. He then zaps them with an electric current to insert a loop of DNA into the developing embryo. The operation is equivalent to changing the activity of one gene in the squirt's DNA. But it has a remarkable effect. Under the laser microscope, Levine and Davidson watch the cells that will form the one-chambered heart. An extraordinary transformation takes place. If you look at the sea squirt embryo, it has spare parts, it has extra cells. Normally those cells form tail muscles. And what we did was to convert those tail muscle cells into extra heart cells. Instead of a single chamber, the sea squirt's heart now has two. And in this case, there's a, a nicely formed long heart here. And then there's this little extra chamber up here. So you'll see these individual blood cells making this kind of S-like twisting motion, moving first through the long chamber and then up and back through the second chamber. We're not just getting a heart that looks like it has two chambers. Those two chambers are really functioning. With one tiny genetic change, they have turned a simple heart into a more complex one in just one generation. Changing genes in the laboratory is one thing, but for evolution to happen, genes have to change by themselves in nature. It turns out that all animals, including us, have a way of making this happen. To pass the instructions for life from one generation to the next, an animal has to copy its DNA. And whenever anything's copied, errors can occur. But the enzymes that are responsible for constantly replicating DNA do not do it with 100% precision. They're a little off. It's almost as if there's a built-in mechanism for change. These random errors are the building blocks of new species. When the DNA changes, genes change, and animals change too. But research in the last few years has thrown up a mystery. When biologists started decoding the DNA of plants and animals in the 1970s, they assumed that the genes of one animal would be very different from another. They were in for a shock. It turns out that when it comes to genes, we humans aren't that different from other species. Around 96% of our DNA is the same as chimpanzees.